Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to NAPW Student Series. We have Dr. Nakia Grayson with us today to be talking about choices, Memphis choices. And without further ado, let's go to the next slide and you can introduce yourself. We can hop okay. on into it. I am Nakia Grayson. Um, I am a nurse midwife, a doctoratorially prepared nurse midwife. Uh, I live in Memphis, Tennessee. I am the director of perinatal services at Choices, uh, Memphis Center for Reproductive Health in Memphis, Tennessee. And I have been with Choices now for three years. Um, I am an anthropologist and public health pro provider or practitioner by training. I uh, have a master's in public health and a master's in anthropology. And after working uh, in public health uh, for a little while, not really focusing on maternal and child health, but really more sexual and reproductive health, specifically around um, uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, I made a, a big pivot and decided to uh, become a nurse midwife. So presently, um, we at Choices see lots of different patients. We have a, a very diverse patient population and um, I was fortunate enough to come to Choices right after I went to nursing school. I went to, well, undergrad, I went to Howard University for, um, and I have a degree in communications and one in a master's in public health. And then I did um, a master's in anthropology at University of Memphis and uh, a master's in nursing at University of Tennessee and a doctorate in nursing at University of Tennessee. So I've done a little bit of school, just, just a little bit. And, and from there, I decided um, that I wanted to really work really hard and restoring midwifery uh, in the Mid-South and um, especially here in Memphis, uh, where we were seeing such um, uh, disparaging numbers in terms of uh, birth outcomes. So uh, that's me. I'm the mother of two beautiful children. They're seven and eight. And uh, my partner and I, he and I have been together uh, 20 years, this, actually this month. So um, yeah, we're parents of two great kids, one boy and one girl, and a really um, feisty puppy. So <laughs> lots of fun. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I read some of the, I read these questions. You know, they had a lot of good questions, right? So let's see. What does the abortion clinic typically look like and what services are provided? Okay, that's a good question. Well, I'll tell you about our clinic. Um, our clinic provides um, medical as well as uh, what's called surgical abortions up into uh, 15 weeks. Um, in Tennessee, uh, the law goes up into 196 here, um, but we uh, go up to 156 and uh, at choices. Um, the services we provide, like I said, are medication abortions uh, for up to 11 weeks. And then after that, you would have to have a surgical abortion. Uh, we provide counseling services, uh, patient education around um, abortions and family planning. We have a huge family planning clinic where we provide uh, patients with uh, all of the birth control options that are out there. Uh, we want people to recognize that they have choices and whatever it is they want to do with their body. We provide um, high quality non-judgmental care. That's really uh, big for us. Uh, but like I said, the, the biggest thing is that we provide uh, family planning, um, abortion services. Our clinic is a little different though. Uh, we do a couple of things that uh, most clinics don't do, and I will get into that later, but uh, our abortion services, usually there's a lot of education and support for uh, patients who come and um, are seeking to have an abortion. So that's really important to us that they, um, they're they highly educated, they can make an informed decision about what uh, they want to do, and they can even choose to have an abortion or they can choose actually to continue their pregnancy and stay with us as well. That's not typical. Of <laughs> most clinics, so that's not typical of most abortion clinics. Most abortion clinics, if they come in for abortion, they have the abortion or if they want to continue their pregnancy, they have to go somewhere else. Well, with us, they can, they can stay with us. So um, 
yeah, so ours is not necessarily the typical um, abortion clinic, but uh, like I said, medication abortion and, and uh, surgical abortion, which is also called aspiration abortion, are the two services, abortion services that we provide. So are you saying they get more choices of choices? They get more choices of choice. I mean, the name is perfect. Okay, the name is perfect. So uh, it works out good. Um, one of the other questions was, what does a birth center typically look like and what services are provided? So that's a good question too. Um, birth centers usually care for pregnant people, right? So they provide prenatal care uh, and support for pregnant people. And at a birth center, a pregnant person can have an out of hospital birth experience. So um, most births occur actually in a hospital. Um, but we see the number of births actually uh, being in out of hospital settings going up. Uh, so there are not that many birth centers in the country. And uh, in Tennessee, we would actually be the second um, birth center in the state right now. There was another birth center. Um, that was in the eastern side of Tennessee for a long time, but they are closed now. So it's only one birth center open right now, and that's in Nashville, and it's called um, it's the Vanderbilt uh, Hospital uh, Birth Center, and and ours will be the second. But typically at a birth center, um, like I said, people come for prenatal care. Uh, they can get childbirth classes. They some. Um, birth centers do classes around sibling classes, you know, just things to support that family and that pregnant person uh, to help them to um, have a healthy baby and be ready to meet that baby, right? So they're trying to prepare them for labor, which can, you know, um, be, which is work, right? You know, we don't want to be like, it's so tremendously painful, but I mean, it's a lot of work. And so, um, a lot of times that care throughout that care they're being prepared for um, labor and delivery i think that also was different is usually uh, birth centers are usually uh run and run by midwives most of, uh, most of them some may be owned by uh, obstetrician or a physician but usually is uh, midwifery care that is being provided for people at birth centers um, and the midwifery model of care really honors uh, physiological birth, right? They recognize that birth is a natural process and uh, really work with uh, families and work with that pregnant person to have a really um, a medicated low intervention birth. So um, that's usually the type of services that are provided at a birth center. Also, they can, uh, they provide postpartum care. So if you've, had a baby before, you know, people who had a baby, a lot of times once they've had that baby, you know, they don't see that provider again for six weeks. They're like, hey, okay, we did our part, you know, go on. And they don't, uh, you don't um, see them again for six weeks where uh, even at Choices and most birth centers, they provide a lot of um, support in that postpartum period because they recognize that that period is really, really important. Um, because it's a huge transition, so, yeah. And also, in regards to um, what does a birth center look like? I mean, I know you mentioned earlier that most people get birth in a hospital, and so yeah. if you have a loved one in a hospital and they just gave birth, maybe you go visit them, and people know what those labor and delivery wards look like. Yeah. Um, but you know, I put a, a bed as an image here with mm. someone's pants and some, you know, sheets to the side. Right. Um, what is a birth center even look like? Like, does yeah, it look that's a good like question. A you know, a birth center typically really looks like, it looks like a, a hotel room, right? Like a upscale hotel room. It's not like a hospital where, you know, they have like machines and uh, medical devices and things all out in the, in the rooms at the hospital. Um, those things are not present, right? They're kind of all tucked away. They're there. <laughs> they're there for safety reasons, but they're all tucked away. And so most of the time, they just look like really, really nice, you know, like a nice bedroom or a nice hotel room. And ours is really, looks like a really nice hotel room, right? Uh, uh, we have a 
great executive director her name is rebecca terrell who is has an eye for all of that she was very clear about this upscale standard that she wanted for this birth center right and um and it's just really pretty and really nice and part of it you know with birthing the atmosphere is really important right so having um a space that's very relaxing and calming and um you know, where people could come in and kind of just be themselves. Also, our birth suites, and a lot of them also in other birth centers, has a really big tub. I mean, the tub is like a, a small swimming pool, right? So <laughs> a really big tub for people to uh, be able to use uh, water as a uh, labor pain management, you know, and therapy. So um, hydrotherapy is real, and it is very helpful, and has helped a lot of people, you know, make it um through labor. Uh, but yeah, most of the rooms are very, very well laid out. Like I said, they're not medical devices laying around. Those things are kind of tucked away in corners or it, really behind cabinets. And we have uh, really huge bathrooms with really big showers so they can go in and they can either sit in the shower, they can stand in the shower. We really try to encourage people to move uh, and um, because movement is really important in labor. So we have bars that they can hold on to, or, you know, it's just other more, um, yeah, it's usually it's outfitted with things that will help to um, bring some comfort in labor. Um, but it's not, we don't have like the continuous monitoring, like people who go to the hospital, they right. make people like strapped to the bed and with, you know, these continuous monitors that show you you know, people's contraction patterns and, you know, fetal heart rate and all this stuff. We don't have that, right? Um, Why not? What do you do instead? Well, we do what's called intermittent monitoring. We just listen to the baby's heart rate, uh, you know, in certain intervals. Um, those things are not necessary if you're not, you know, doing interventions, if you're not, you know, introducing medications or, um, you know, like usually when people get epidurals or if a person is on Pitocin or something like that, they, they need those interventions. If they have those interventions, they need to be monitored because we need to know how those interventions are affecting the baby, right? So that's why they have to have what's called continuous monitoring. But if they're not, if they're not, um, we're not doing those things to them, then, you know, we just listen every you know, 30 minutes or so, just listen for the baby's heart rate and kind of uh, listen to see how the baby is handling the contractions. And so it, it's, it works fine, you know, and it's, uh, uh, it allows, and it really allows that pregnant person to be able to move around and uh, to find comfort in their own way, right? You know, they're not, they don't have to lay still, they don't have to, you know, um, be confined to a bed and that's really that's really important especially uh in labor when you know you need to kind of move your pelvis to be able to help the baby to kind of do what they call some cardinal moves to get out so yeah well that's mm -hmm. nice and uh fa just asked in the chat are there photos of the birth center you know there are you know i i didn't even think i could have probably walked you through it um because uh yeah, I'm still at the office. And so it's like literally across the street from me because I'm sitting in our other building. Um, but there are photos and I don't think I have any on my computer, but I will make sure I post some of them. I'll post a video, I'll walk through. If you're my friend on Instagram and I recently, and I did not know this because I'm not all that tech savvy. You know, I'm not social media savvy like everybody else is. But so uh, I... I had all of these like requests to follow me or whatever. And I didn't realize I had to click on them, but um, <laughs> then I, <laughs> I uploaded uh, some pictures of us at the birth center and my colleagues were like, oh, we can't share them because you know, your thing is private. So when I, I was like, okay, well I can change this. So when I made it public, yeah. all of these people were then <laughs> able to see. And I was like, oh, well I'll leave it like that so that they can see see the pictures. So I'll post some pictures tomorrow because actually I'm walking through the building tomorrow. We're um, we're in the process of all the furniture just got delivered and all the boxes are everywhere. So that we're, you know, arranging furniture and... Uh, For your move, you got a move coming out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're so excited about it. I mean, um, it has been a, a labor of love, you know, when we first decided to do it. Um, 
Rebecca had this vision for it about five years ago and uh, she and I had uh, gone to dinner and she tells a story that she followed me to this conference. I did not know that she did this, but uh, she had sent me a message was like, hey, can we get together for dinner? I was at the conference and she was at the conference in Georgia. And I was like, okay, sure. And so um, she proposed this idea of this comprehensive reproductive uh, healthcare center and added midwifery services to it. And I was like, hey, what, how do you feel about this? I was like, you know, we're in the South, right? <laughs> you know that Choices is, is a first trimester abortion clinic. And she's like, yeah, I know. I was like, okay, well, all right. If you know those things and you know, yeah. to move forward, then I'm willing to move forward with you. And so um, we did something that um, was just an idea. We really were building a bridge as we crossed it in had to raise um, $5 million to build the building. And Choices, you know, now I was gonna go into it a little later, but we can talk about it now. Choices had not um, ever undertook a capital campaign and to raise funds with something as massive as this. You know, we always had an annual fundraiser called Condemonium where we raised um, funds for our patient assistance fund. Uh, and our patient assistance fund was used to help uh, patients who needed abortions or who were coming in uh, for hormone therapy, our transgender patients who couldn't pay for their labs or even um, patients who uh, wanted to start PrEP, which is a pre-exposure prophylaxis HIV meds, but had to pay for lab work to be able to do that. So our fundraising really was always to be able to serve patients and for them to uh, not uh, be burdened with those costs or, you know, th those costs to be prohibitive to them coming to get care. But when we decided to do this project, we realized we had to do like this really big fundraiser, right? And so then we had to tell our story and we actually had a really great story. So uh, we were able to raise the $5 million to build the building. And so we were moving out of our 6,000 square foot building that, um, had two exam rooms, which is busting at the seams, <laughs> into a 16,000 square foot building. Oh, it, yeah. With six, ex, yeah, with six exam rooms, two procedure rooms, and three birthing suites. And so, uh, you know, we, we're really proud of that. But I told Rebecca and Jennifer, who is our uh, operations uh, director, I was like, the building is too small. <laughs> we've already, you know, in our mind, we've already outgrown it. But yeah. Uh, so it's a good place to be. Yeah. That is awesome. We're so excited to see those videos. Yeah. So I will definitely, uh, tomorrow, I'll make sure I post some, some pictures and Amazing. things when I walk through the building. So if you, my, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll, you'll be able to see them. Yeah. So yeah, someone asked, why aren't these services typically provided under one roof? So yeah, so choices is different in that we have a purposefully brought back together birth services and abortion services. And uh, part of the reason they, they're not typically provided under one roof is because, um, because of, uh, because antis have really tried to stigmatize abortion, right? Uh, abortion services and abortion is nothing new. Uh, people have been having abortions for as long as we've been here on the earth and, um, we've allowed uh, this medical service that many people need to be highly stigmatized. And so um, a lot of um, the services, abortion providers who provide those abortion services uh, find themselves really operating in these silos and in spaces where it's so um, polarizing and, and really hush hush. And like I said, highly stigmatized, uh, but uh, the same people that we provide abortion care for are the same people who get pregnant and have children and have babies, right? So um, why wouldn't we serve them? We already provide them with reproductive health care and birth, uh, pregnancy and birth is part of reproductive health care. So um, it was very important for us to to provide these services together. And really what we found when we like did our community needs assessment and our study is that people wanted the services. Um, they wanted uh, midwifery services. 
uh, but a lot of the barriers they were having in terms of uh, access and abortion care were the same services they were having and access and midwifery care, right? So, um, so we, we were like, okay, well, how can we help that? You know, how can we help our community who was asking for these services? In Memphis, there are not that many midwives. And actually, when I decided to become a midwife, there were only two nurse midwives at uh, one of the local hospitals, because it's only one hospital here that credentials midwives. And it was maybe four certified professional midwives. So those are uh, home birth midwives. They specialize in home birth. And um, it was only four of them. And none of these people were people of color. None of them were black women. And, um, and so Memphis is a predominantly black city uh, with about 62%. And they were not being represented in their care. And like I said, midwifery care here uh, was really not available to all communities. So, um, you know, how, how do we make this uh, accessible for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that was what, what we wanted to make sure that we were able to do. You kind of even answered the next question. Why should these services be offered together? Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. They should be offered together because it's just, it's just natural for, um, for us to care for people along their whole reproductive lifespan. You know, why, why are we breaking this up? Why are we saying, okay, over here, you can, you know, we can do these services for you, but not these services. So it was really important for us to be able to provide this holistic, comprehensive care for people. And, and, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. So just because things yeah. stigmatize doesn't mean the need isn't there. And it's no, like, no, no absolutely. I mean, but you know, to me, midwifery is highly stigmatized, right? You know, when people start saying, I'm going to have an out of hospital birth, you will see how fast people will jump on you. Okay. They, they're not for that. Okay. Their families are not usually very supportive of their choices of having an out of hospital birth. And so, um, in the same ways, you know, we have to really, you know, protect people's space and environment and, uh, protect their choices. And, um, especially around, uh, birth and their birthing options. So, uh, people who choose to have an out of hospital birth that is, yeah, it's not usually well supported, you know, in the community, unfortunately, but we want to change that because uh, it is a viable option. And we want to make sure people have that the option of having an out of hospital or in hospital birth, that they can birth wherever they, wherever they want. Um, you said, what are the benefits to providing abortion and birth services under one roof? Um, I think continuity of care is one really big benefit, you know. Um, I think that that's a huge problem uh, in healthcare right now, especially in prenatal and maternity care, is um, a lot of times people, they see several different providers, you know, especially if they're in a large group or if they go to a clinic, like here in Memphis, if they um, go to the uh, any of the like FQHCs, the federally qualified health centers, um, they don't know who they're going to see. They don't know who they're going to see that day for their prenatal care. And they don't know who's going to see and who's going to be with them when they get ready to, um, to you know, uh, have their baby. And that is, to me, very important that they have that, develop that trust and that relationship with their provider. And how can you develop that when you have 10 different providers or you're not even sure who you're going to see? And really, um, for us, the benefit was really being able to um, care for everyone that came to, through our doors, people who were uh, not sure what decision they wanted to make one way or another. We provide patient education and, and have been able to support people who say, hey, no, I want to go through with uh, an abortion and we support them and help them through that. And then we've had those who come in for abortions and then they change their mind and we have been able to care for them and uh, care for them to the end of their pregnancy. So um, it is uh, really important to us that we be able to uh, provide um, just high quality, like I said, non-judgmental care for our, um, for all that come through our doors. Um, 
another thing about providing these services together, especially as an abortion clinic, right? Um, to me, abortion clinics really can look at diversifying their services in terms of um, meeting the needs of their community. Um, to me, providing um, this service can be a low hanging fruit for them in a way that they can really uh, tap into their community and um, be be what's needed. You know, we're a nonprofit organization, so we don't look at it in the same way as uh, some for profit clinics. So that does help us out a lot. Okay, so the history of choices. Okay, so choices was started in 1974 uh, by a group of feminists right after Roe, and they saw a need in the community um, to provide first trimester abortions. And at the time, um, choices literally that's all they did they provided first trimester abortions it was a cash only system mm -hmm. um, they had a part-time physician that came in and uh, and provided uh, abortion services and that was it you know and so over the years uh, as we've you know evolved and grown uh, we really started to um, recognize that there were a lot of different healthcare needs in the community especially around um, sexual and reproductive health. And so uh, we started providing services in terms uh, for persons who were HIV positive. Um, a lot of times in the beginning, um, especially when HIV was very new and not necessarily understood, you know, the thought was, okay, you have HIV, we send you to this infectious disease doctor, they treat, treat your disease, and that is it, you know, and that is your life, right? But these people are whole human beings and, yeah. and their sexual and reproductive health care needs were not being, uh, you know, cared for. And so we started doing that and caring for um, persons who were HIV positive and helping them with their reproductive health care needs. And it expanded to, um, to transgender persons in our community who needed hormone therapy and um, now we see about 250 transgender persons um, in our uh, transgender clinic uh, that we provide hormone therapy and really just some, some basic uh, medical care for. Um, and then we started, and, and even with our transgender patients in our, um, we started seeing that they needed care in terms of their fertility, um, fertility treatments and things like that. And in Memphis at that time, you know, some years ago, and it really wasn't that long ago, maybe 10, 10 12 years ago, uh, if you were not uh, married or, um, or if you were a same-sex couple, you could not receive care at the local fertility clinic. So we provided some basic, you know, fertility services for uh, families. And, and then we decided to, uh, to add, uh, birth services. So I came on in 2017, June of 2017, um, to start the midwifery services that we have here. And we've, uh, we're the only, I'm the only provider in the city that provides a hospital or out of hospital birth. And so we have uh, been able to give people an option in terms of where they want to birth. So yeah, so it's been an interesting history. And so this is actually a, a drawing of the new building, but the the building is now up, so it's not, uh, we don't even have to look at the drawing anymore. So it's just been a really great um, process. Um, but yeah, so we've been here since 1974. And so we got another 100 years, 150 years of work left to do, right? Um, so yeah, we'll see. What makes choices unique? Uh, I think we kind of talked about this, you know, what makes us unique. I think that, um, our services in terms of having this comprehensive reproductive health care system here uh, that is grounded in reproductive justice principles, you know, recognizing that we have to center um, families and center our pregnant people or center even really center any of our patients that walk through the door uh, and recognizing that they are the expert of their body, that they are a valued part of uh, the care team and really um, trying to provide them with the best uh, care possible, right? We, we are uh, 
evidence-based. We provide them with as much information as we possibly can and recognize that it is their right to, uh, to you know, choose services or not to choose services. I think that's one of the things that's really hard for a lot of providers. You know, we talk about, you know, informed consent is a real big buzzword right now, but we don't talk about informed refusal, right? <laughs> you can refuse, you know, and how do we deal with that? And what does that look like? You know, and so those things are really important to us. I think, um, like I said, our transgender clinic is really big. We have patients who come from up to three hours away to, um, to receive care. And to us, that's not, you know, while we are proud of the services that we provide, no one should really have to travel three hours away to, um, to seek care. And even for our midwifery care as well, we have people who, you know, travel great distances to come to be cared for at our clinic. And so to me, it's an honor to care for everybody that comes through the door um, because they trust us and uh, we don't take that lightly. So I think that definitely the birth services, our transgender clinic, and now this birth center definitely separates us from most of the abortion clinics in, uh, in the country. Yeah. And we have a, a question in the, the Q&A section. And mm -hmm. uh, for the people who are attending, please do give a thumbs up to the questions you want us to address so we can make sure and get to those that mm -hmm. everyone's wanting to ask. Uh, we have one that, what role do you see birth, birthing centers playing in the future of reproductive justice? Yeah, I think that, I think that birthing centers have a unique opportunity, right? To be able to be a model, or a disruptive model to our present uh, healthcare um, framework that we have. I mean, we know it's broken. It's been broken for a long time. And uh, the care is very fragmented and very uh, discriminatory. And I think that birth centers, especially birth centers that are willing to, um, to listen to, uh, listen to their, their, their patients and uh, really center those families and really help them to have, uh, you know, these amazing uh, outcomes and, and, um, interactions with uh, the healthcare industry can can really change how we do things, right? But we have to really work very hard to be to integrate ourselves into this medical model because we can't have you know birth centers over here alone, like on the outskirts. We have to really be integrated into um, the medical model of care. There are some great examples, you know, in the country of. Um, this integration, but I think that we have to do a lot of education around what midwives do and um, and and how we are a valued resource. I think that for a long time, um, midwives have kind of like tried to operate under the radar. You know, we just kind of <laughs> try not to be noticed too much because, you know, too much attention can then bring, you know, other issues, but we can't we can't hide what it is that we do and the value that we have especially um, to our communities. So, yeah. Beautiful. You got another, another question, Kendall, you want me to go? I think the next slide is my favorite. And so I'm very yeah. excited for it. Cause so, so one thing that the student organizers were just like, mm -hmm. oh, please ask Nakia to do this okay. is to share any personal narratives you have of someone who, you know, you've, you've helped with abortion services and then yeah. caught their baby or yeah. miscarriage management and then also worked with fertility like when have yeah. you been able to see these these different I, services come together to fly? i will say i'll talk about myself first about my own personal journey to midwifery because i really never saw myself doing this um i think that choices is unique and that it has provided me an opportunity to care for um for everybody everybody right so Usually, like even in my midwifery training, we only did hospital births, right? And uh, I literally only did, took care of uh, pregnant people, you know, did prenatal care. And then, you know, um, the catches we had to get for to be able to graduate. But at Choices, I have been able to care for all sorts of patients and really to meet them where they are. And so I remember my first home birth. And that baby was born on May 7th, mm. 2017. Actually, I remember all of them. And I remember all their birthdays right now. So oh. um, 
which is crazy because I will text the moms like on their birthday, you know, hey, tell so and so happy birthday because I remember all of them, and so because they have all had a huge uh, impact on me, and um, I've been I'm forever grateful that they trusted me to to care for them, but. I think my first one was, and I'm, I'll say her name because I know she won't mind. And she's a local doula here. Her name is Maya Janelle Peak. And uh, Maya at the time was working with us at Choices and decided that she wanted an out of hospital birth. And it was her first baby. And, um, and I remember being with her. And even with the, the births I had attended in the hospital. And I actually, while I was in school, was also a labor and delivery nurse because I wanted to see, you know, what high risk obstetric looked like. So I worked uh, on labor and delivery at uh, the Safety Net Hospital. Hmm, something's flying. The Safety Net Hospital here in, in Memphis. And so, so I had experience with birth and birthing people, but not outside of the hospital. And Maya's birth was the first that I had attended. And to be with her uh, was transformative for not just her, but for me as well, um, to be there to provide her with support, um, you know, while she labored, to be with her uh, while she um, labored in the pool, to be with her. And when she got to a point where you knew that uh, she felt like she couldn't do it anymore. And they, and Maya had a notebook that she had written all of these scriptures and different uh, affirmations in, and to then just get that book and start reading it to her, you know, and whatever oh. her affirmations were to read them out loud to her was just as uh, soothing to her as it was to, to me, you know, and so, um, and to be with her and to and to remind her that she was doing it. You know, she kept saying, I can't do this. Well, you, you are doing it. And you were, and she was so strong. And, um, and I remember after her daughter, her daughter's name is Sophia, after Sophia was, was born, um, you could see how it changed Maya, not just physically, but spiritually in that, mo in that moment when she, um, she reached down and, and picked her baby up and cradled her to her chest. It was, it was just an amazing moment, not just for her, but for me as well. And in that moment, I knew that I was doing the work that I was supposed to be doing, right? I was doing the work that I was called to do. And I realized in those moments that I was called to help restore Black midwifery in the South. And it just, um, it's amazing because uh, even though the, uh, you know, a lot of times what I found, like, you know, when I was in the hospital and I was caring for women in the hospital and doing births in the hospital, um, I didn't necessarily remember those births, right? I didn't remember, I, if I saw the people again, because I remember pretty much everybody, I would remember them, but I couldn't reflect on them. They were all like, they all kind of ran together. And since, um, uh, 2017, I've had about 96, I think 96 births. And I remember every one of them. That is like the type of imprint that they have had on me. And so, um, and then the second one was actually my, my assistant, her name is Alexia's Hill. She's my assistant now. She wasn't my assistant then, uh -huh. but she was uh, my second home birth. And, um, and all of these children, I see all of them all the time. And Sophia was here recently and Chloe was here. And we really do become a community and a family really, because uh, I get to, I just get to be a part of their story and I get to see them and they bring the kids to see us. But what I also found grew out of that was also a lot of these, um, these uh, pregnant people who I was able to care for have now gone on to be doulas. And uh, Alexia, who is my assistant, she's with us. She's also uh, our birth attendant, but she's studying to be a midwife also now. So she gets to be here with us hands on. And, um, and that's amazing to me because it's, you know, we can see the fruits of our labor, you know, we're paying it forward. Lex is an amazing birth attendant. She's an amazing doula. She's very receptive and, and she's going to make a great midwife. She's going to be a great midwife, you know, and I realized, like I said, for me, this job was, or becoming a midwife was a second career, right? You know, I'm, 
I'm trying to retire one day soon. And so my goal was really to open the door and help to train as many uh, black midwives as I could. And so I think that I'm doing that, right? And so that work has been really, really amazing to me. But I feel like all of these births are also my births, right? So I have never, I have the mother of two children, but I've never given birth. And so each of these births have been uh, very personal to me because uh, I remember back in, and I'm, this is probably the most personal I've ever gotten. I can't even believe I'm getting this personal on a, on a uh, you know, like a, a live um, feed. But anyway, um, I remember in like 20, 20, 10, 2011, I was uh, with my pastor, who was also a really good friend. And she she said, I want to pray for you. And uh, in her prayer, and I had not even decided to become a midwife at that time, she said, you're going to be the mother of many. Oh, and oh I don't think that she knew, I really realized what she was saying in that moment, but she did tell me, she was like, you're going to be the mother of many. And, um, and I feel like I am, right? So I'm there with all of these beautiful um, people who are birthing. And I feel like um, it's a birth for me every time, every time I haven't, I can't think of any that I haven't felt some sort of connection to these families. And I think that is also like the difference in the care that we're providing is relationship-based care. And there's a lot of trust and a lot of love there. And um, yeah, I mean, we have patients. I had one who, uh, actually recently, uh, I caught her baby, her last baby in July of 2018. And then uh, I was her midwife for this baby as well. And um, she found herself during COVID to be homeless and, and, and was staying in a shelter. And, and she was like, I'm not going to the hospital. I'm not going to the hospital. And so um, to work with, within that system where she was staying at this shelter and to help her to give birth in this space uh, so that she didn't have to uh, go to the hospital was, um, was really amazing. So, you know, we really try to help people to have the experience that they want. And, um, and it's been, and it's been really good. I mean, I think it also reveals to us even more the fragmentation of the system and how the system is very harmful um, to uh, black and brown people and how we really have to stand up and advocate, right? And so uh, I've had patients who've come and, like I said, who've come in for terminations and then decide to um, to carry their, their pregnancies to term and really have to uh, help them to get the care they need, but not just the uh, medical care, but even the social services that they need, right? And that's just as important um, so that we can make sure that they are whole, feel whole when they meet their babies, right? So I don't know. I think that, uh, like I said, we've had 90 some births now and all of them have been really special. And right now I'm at the point where I'm having lots of repeats, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm on, I think this year I've had maybe seven who I was their midwife before. And so, um, Jennifer Pepper, who is our amazing finance and operations person, is always, Nakia, you're not supposed to be taking any new patients who we get in the building. I was like, well, they're not new. I cared for them before. So I have to keep caring for them, you know? So, uh, yeah. So also I can't say no. So they, they've taken my phone away from me, which is why <laughs> my assistant feels all the calls now, because if they uh -huh. called and they got me, I'd be like, okay, yeah, come on in the care. I'm a care for you. It's fine. But no, it's just been an amazing um, experience, a humbling experience to be with uh, families and to be able to care for them in this way. This is uh, the type of care they are supposed to receive. This is what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to um, have community health workers. We are supposed to be the healers and uh, providers for our community. Um, and I'm, and I, I'm doing that. And so I, I think that there's no greater love than I have right now than what I'm doing. Um, and I have a great supportive family because you have to have a really good supportive family to do this because I'm away from the house mm -hmm. a whole lot. <laughs> and, but my kids understand, they know what I do. And my husband has been very supportive over the years. So, but yeah, I think that 
I'm trying to think any crazy stories. Uh, no, I mean, I think all of the births have been very different. You know, you have some who uh, usually, if you have, if they're, they're, they're first time pregnancy, they can take a little longer, you know, um, and their labors are a little longer. And sometimes I've been at some of them and I'm like, okay, why did I choose this? <laughs> I should have been a barista or something, right? I mean, they've gone on for days. But no, I think that they all, you know, just have been amazing and, um, and a learning experience for me. I feel like I had to learn very fast because there was not, and really uh, still isn't a large midwifery community in Memphis. And so uh, there wasn't a lot of support. And um, everyone that I told what I wanted to do was like, oh, you can't do that. You know, or no, um, you can't practice because there are no physicians that will practice with you or you, uh, you're new to this, you, you don't know what you're doing or, you know, so it was really um, me being dedicated to what I felt I was called to do. I felt that, uh, like I said, I felt that I had a, a responsibility to restore um, midwifery to um, the community here and to really open the door for those who uh, wanted to come through and to provide that training opportunity and um, just, you know, to do what I can while I'm, while I'm here, right? And the, it's easy to, you know, provide care and have this, well, not easy to provide care, but it's easy to have this idea of, oh, I'm gonna provide care for, you know, community, for my community, but it's, you have to have a bigger vision outside yourself, right? And so the vision for me was to, like I said, open the door for others, provide training opportunities for others, provide um, opportunities for other non-traditional uh, birth workers in our communities and really to help grow those birth workers, right? Help grow doulas, help grow midwives, help to grow lactation um, counselors in our community because we just, we didn't, we didn't have it. So, yeah. <sighs> What's your question, Kendall? Do you have a question? I just, oh, I'm just, my, my coworker just texted me to say, mother of, like, you know, mother of, what was it, thousands, mother of many? That, that yeah, yeah, she told me I was going to be mother of many, right? And I was like, you know, she reminded me of that because I didn't know she re remembered. Like I said, it was like maybe like 2011 that she said that to me. I don't, I don't, I didn't know she remembered saying it to me and I, and she did. And I'm not surprised because she remembers everything, but, um, she was like, I don't know if I knew this was the path for you, you know? And I was like, I knew, I didn't, I know I didn't know it was the path for me. So, uh, but it has been um, definitely, um, um, you know, fulfilling to me, but also, you know, her, her prophetic voice to me that, yeah. you know, that um, this would happen was, uh, not something that either one of us had, you know, imagined, but, um, but yeah, yeah, I get to, to be with people in their most vulnerable and empowering um, instances in their life, you know, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing to, to do this type of work. But I think that, you know, um, one of the things I will say, and I say it to my students, is that I think also that we've kind of like romanticized the work too, right? This mm -hmm. is very hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this, this was a heavy lift, mm -hmm. um, especially to um, come into a community where midwives were not really uh, accepted, and then to be the only black community midwife um, in a space that um, was not very accepting was very hard, right? So you can't it's not for, um, it's not for the week. And, you know, cause people were, were very clear that, um, they wanted to see it fail or wanted not only to see me fail, but to see choices fail in this, in this endeavor. And I was clear that we weren't. And I think our team, I know our team was clear that we would, that we would not, and uh, that this was totally needed. But I think that a lot of times people think, oh, you do birth work, you're with people that are uh, pregnant and babies, and it's not, it's, not, it's not always that, right? It's not always 
um, it's not always roses and, you know, and happy times. We are dealing with one of the things, um, another main reason I got into the work, and I don't think I had told you this, Kendall, was so I was uh, in, I was working on an anthropology project with the March of Dimes where they were, um, they were doing this uh, this project called Community Voices, and what they were doing was um, trying to provide education about infant mortality. And at the time, Memphis had the highest infant mortality rate in the country. And for those who don't know, infant mortality is death uh, up into the age of one, and for babies. And um, they had the highest infant mortality rate. They had partnered with the March of Dimes. Church, this, these local churches had partnered with the March of Dimes to bring this education. And so what I had to do was evaluate the program and do focus groups. And so in talking to these families and talking to them about infant loss and realizing that they were having generational infant loss uh, was very um, overwhelming. Yeah. And so it really put me on a path to figure out a way to um, to help these communities and to real to to try to find out what was missing and to me what I realized what's missing was uh, the care of black midwives that at one time was prolific in these communities but had been um, uh, run out of these communities through policy and politics right and so the demonization of black midwives and um, the devastation it had to these communities. And so that was really important to me in doing this work was the restoration of um, Black midwifery in, in Memphis and in the Mid-South. And so um, I think I was a little naive in thinking, okay, I'm gonna do this and this is gonna be great and people are gonna be receptive to it. And, um, and that's when I realized that, that midwifery uh, was highly stigmatized as well as abortion care. And so, like I said, a lot of the things that we saw were barriers to midwifery care were the same barriers we saw for abortion care. So um, I think that my my thoughts were, if I do the work, that it'll speak for itself. And it has, you know, so we just we just keep doing the work, that's all. You know, and I hear you saying that the work is romanticized. And as you were saying that, more and more people were asking uh, for you to answer this next question, which makes me think you have some people in the chat who are like, I'm still here to do the work. Like, I. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. No, I've met a lot of those that are still here to do the work. Yeah. What's the question? <laughs> um, does choices work with full spectrum doulas? And so maybe they people do. who are trying to get into that, you know, get a little. Get the yeah, absolutely. Back. We do. We absolutely do. We actually. Um, train for spectrum doulas. Um, we haven't done as much training with them, you know, um, as of late, especially around COVID, because we have had to change our protocols about who's in the clinic and everything, but we absolutely do. And then they're also like, uh, we had, you know, we had, I think, the first full spectrum doula collective in the city. And of course, those doulas really provided a lot of abortion care. Mm -hmm. uh, in the clinic, we always had them in the clinic, and um, and they were doulas for those patients who were who had come in to have abortions. Now they didn't have as many opportunities at that time to do birth to be a birth doula, but now uh, we have those opportunities for them, and we actually had a uh, birth a birth doula and postpartum doula training um, here at the clinic. Uh, and what's really interesting is that a lot of the um, the people that came to the, that training were people who were my my clients whose babies I caught, and so a lot of them had then gone on to become doulas. And I see them at births, and they'll call me, and they're like, you know, so and so wants to come into care, and they called your assistant, and they said no, and I'm like, okay, so they kind of started like. Cir trying to circumvent the system. Yeah. They, they do circumvent the system. I'm sorry, Lex, if you listen, I'm sorry. She, she's always like, how did this person get in? You know, so, you know, they get, like I said, they get in contact with me. I usually say yes, but, um, but yes, we do. We do train full spectrum doulas. And my hope is that, you know, we're in a new normal now, right? With uh, COVID and all that has happened with it. My hope is that we will definitely get back to, to doing more of that. Um, we are working on, we do have um, 
we will have more midwifery students in 2021. Uh, it's really important to me that um, we train midwives. Um, like I said, my assistant, she's a birth attendant right now. So we're training her as a birth attendant. We are um, going to start to train more birth attendants because we want people to be able to help with out of hospital birth uh, experiences. And um, yeah, so we do, we do provide the training, the full spectrum doula training. You have another question for me, Kendall? <laughs> Always, you know, just so many questions. Well, one thing I was hoping that you could touch on, and I just love the language that you use when you're talking about birth. It's ta you're talking about care and you're talking about catching babies. And you mentioned yeah. that with your first at-home client, they reach down. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so what, can you, can you, for some people, I don't think they realize, and I didn't realize this until I started watching like the business of being born, that when some people are doing, you know, at a birth center or, um, giving birth at home, that they straight up reach down. Yeah, they reach down. Absolutely. And they're like, here's my baby. Like, right. the, the phrase, like, like, Sarah, reach down and get your baby. It's oh, like, yeah. what? Like, yeah. and, you know, that, that's, that has to just be, oh my gosh, I can't imagine what's going through the brain. It, you reach down and... It's different because, you know, like even... Um, so the last birth I was at was on July 21st. Like I tell you, I remember all these babies' birthdays. So it was on July 21st. And actually, it was a really good friend of mine. She had, um, she had, had a very traumatic first birth experience. And uh, she wanted to do a VBAC. She had a C-section the first time. And uh, she was determined. She was like, I'm not going to the hospital and I'm going to be at home. And I was like, okay. So I can remember when she was getting very tired and she felt like, oh, I can't do this. I was like, reach down and feel your baby's head. Your baby's head is right there. And she just reached down and felt her baby's head. And I promise you, it felt, you could see that her energy changed. Then she was like, okay, I can do this. I can push this baby out. But she was really tired. She was like, I'm over it. Just take me to the hospital. I was like, no, nope, reach down and feel your baby's head. She touched her head. She, could, she was like, she has hair. I said, oh yeah, she has lots of hair. And so she, you know, she found the strength to, you know, to push and to, to pull, pull her out. But yeah, a lot of times they, um, families and they, they want, you know, to be interactive and they want to be involved. And we have many partners who are there who reach down and catch their babies and, and, um, and hand them to their partners and yeah you know we have a mirror sometimes so that they can see what they're doing it's just you know there's no rules right <laughs> the only rule is safe be safe right that's you know i tell everybody i feel like the guardian of safety their right. bodies are doing what it is that they're supposed to do so i'm just there to to keep people safe but yeah she posted the video of her um her birth. And I didn't know she was, you know, that she was going to post this video. And I was like, okay, I'm like, every person who wants to do a VBAC is going to call me now. You like get lots of calls from people about VBACs. Um, but yeah, she had one at home and she was just so happy and so grateful. And, um, and I was, I was happy that we were able to help her rewrite her birth story. Right. Because like I said, her first one was very traumatic and, uh, very hard for her. And she, yeah, she felt really um, unheard in her first pregnancy. She had uh, she had told them things that she was experiencing, and they ignored her. And then they ended up having to go back for emergency C section. So I think that um, you know it was really important um, to me and for her to have this new experience, right? And uh, and she's just she's just over the moon happy. Her husband is happy. He's a videographer. He's the one who did the video. I know people probably if they saw the video, they'd be like, "What is this? A choices promo?" It was not. It was not planned. He he did the video and then he showed it to us. Uh, actually, the day that he 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 uploaded it, but it was really beautiful and um, I think it really captured uh, what we do because I remember coming back and uh, to the clinic and um, my coworkers seeing it and they were like wait a minute this is what y'all do <laughs> this is what you do i was like yes yes so you know they would only see me in clinic doing our regular gyn clinic yeah for uh you know these people who were coming in with, with just problem visits they never 
saw the birth side because we were either at home with a very small team or I was going to the hospital. So they didn't, they didn't really have a good understanding. And so when they saw the video, they were like, wow, we did not know that this is what you do. So yeah, it was really good. That's incredible. Wow. Nikki, I wish this was like part one of 37 of right, 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 right. narratives because all I yeah. want to do is sit yeah. here and listen more, but we should talk about the barriers of, you know, like why, why isn't everyone doing this? Why isn't right. everyone giving this full spectrum care with doulas and mm -hmm. amazing midwives and meeting yeah. people where they're at and mm -hmm. providing backs? Like what, what are these, lay these barriers on me. I think that what we have to do is we have to provide a lot of education about what midwives do, what our scope of practice is, and how we can really help to, um, to care for our communities and really combat these uh, disparities and inequities that we are seeing in our community, right? And so some of the barriers uh, are, well, there are state and local <laughs> laws that are different in every state, right? And so in Tennessee, while Tennessee is very, um, excuse me, open to certified professional midwives, we do have certified professional midwives here. They can be licensed here in Tennessee. Um, there are not a lot of um, medical providers, specifically physicians who are willing to work with, uh, uh, sorry, that are willing to work with um, midwives. And that that is a huge barrier, especially for nurse midwives, because in Tennessee, you have to have what's called a collaborative agreement to uh, be able to practice. And if you don't have that, then you cannot practice as a midwife. And so that is very hard. And what we have to do is really grow more uh, physicians who are open to collaborating with uh, midwives. Fortunately for me, I think, uh, I know that working in the hospital as a labor and delivery nurse while I was going to school at night to become a midwife um, really helped because I made friends and, um, you know, and formed relationships with some OBs who, were, who have been very supportive. And uh, yeah, it's like four of them that have really, really stepped up and been very supportive. Um, and when I've needed help, because we all need help, um, they have been there to help me. So um, the laws are a huge barrier in terms of midwifery care. Uh, also insurance um, can be a huge problem, right? A lot of times insurance, uh, public or private, do, don't necessarily cover uh, midwifery care and definitely not an out of hospital birth. Um, Let's see. I think we even yeah. have specific questions about that. Uh huh. Go ahead. Um, I think they're on the the next slides that the the student okay. organizers had asked. We could... Okay. Let's see what they say. Uh, cost barriers. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, is there a price difference between giving birth at a birth center versus a hospital? Yeah, there is. It's usually less expensive to give birth at a birth center than it is at a hospital. Midwifery care is uh, less than usually far less than obstetric care going to a position. Um, we're talking about like in Memphis, the average cost for out of hospital birth, um, a home birth is about four to $5,000. And that's for the prenatal care, the birth and the postpartum care, right? Whereas if you go to the hospital, it, you know, you're talking about anywhere from 10,000 up to $30,000, you know, and we're talking about for vaginal birth, don't, don't have a C-section and that's a whole nother uh, issue. So there is a huge price difference in terms of um, having a out of hospital birth versus a, a hospital birth. Um, I think it's a little bit uh, more transparent in the cost, you know, like many people who have private insurance can call the insurance when they, okay, I'm pregnant. Um, I want to know what the costs are going to be. You will not get a straight answer. You're just not going to get a straight answer. Whereas, like I said, usually with midwifery care, we'll tell you this is the cost. Let's do a payment plan or we'll see what your insurance will cover and we kind of work it that way. Uh, we have a biller here at our clinic. So we send them over to the biller and the biller talks to them about those things and, and really kind of uh, helps them to set, set that up. How does insurance work when going to a birth center? Okay, um, 
it kind of depends. So like some midwives will not take insurance because it's just, it's very, very hard to deal with insurance companies. Um, yeah, I don't think I, I think I've learned way too much <laughs> in these three years. You know, I thought that, I thought that when I went to school, I was going to come out, I was going to practice and that's all I was going to do. I didn't realize that I was going to have to really uh, know the ins and outs of the business of birth, right? So um, some insurance companies won't cover out of hospital births. And so that becomes a, a cost that's usually passed on the families. Um, we have been very intentional at choices of uh, centering um, black and brown families and families that are on 10 care, which is our state Medicaid and our state Medicaid reimbursement is awful. It's, it's practically nothing. And so we lose money on those births and we knew that. So, um, you know, sometimes there are um, uh, practices that have like a payer mix where they'll have like, you know, 80% private or self pay and then like 10, 20% um, Medicaid, where our Medicaid numbers are higher. So like um, last year, I'll talk about the last year numbers because I just looked at those. Last year, 82% of my patients were Medicaid patients. And that was intentional because we, you know, we knew that we wanted to center those families. But um, be, being a nonprofit helps us to be able to do that, but is is definitely, uh, we lose money on that. But uh, that is a that's a policy pro problem, right? That's a, we need to fight for uh, better, you know, reimbursements. We need to fight for Medicaid expansion dollars because Tennessee, of course, didn't take it. So, so some, um, if they, the birth centers have billers or um, finance people who, who will fight with insurance companies, um, then you can have a birth to the birth center, but you have to fight with your insurance company and they have to fight with them as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, not fun. Um, can a birth center turn you away if you can't pay? Absolutely they can and they will. Uh, it's just, I mean, because everybody deserves to be paid for their services, right? So uh, like I said, it kind of depends on the type of payer mix that they have and um, you know, if you take Medicaid, you you are not you cannot charge above what Medicaid pays. So let's say uh, Medicaid reimburses fifteen hundred dollars, but your cost uh, or your you know you charge forty five hundred dollars. You can't go after those Medicaid patients for three that three thousand dollar difference. Um, but you know, if you have people who have private insurance or self pay then you, know, you can kind of work out a payment plan with them, but it can be cost prohibitive if you have to come out of your pocket. And which is why a lot of families were, which is why cost was a huge barrier to a lot of families, uh, low income families, because who has $4,500, $5,000 sitting around somewhere, you know, to say, okay, let me pay this money to, you know, have, have a, the birth of my choice. And yeah. so we really shouldn't have to have to do all of that. Are birth center services typically covered by Medicaid? Mm. Well, that's a tricky question, right? So you can, um, Medicaid does, um, you, can, you can be a Medicaid provider and get reimbursed by Medicaid, but the reimbursement usually is poor. Um, in, in Tennessee, the reimbursement is like $1,500, $1,600. That's for the prenatal care, the birth and postpartum care, right? Um, but birth centers typically have a facility fee, you know, that, um, they charge and, and some states Medicaid won't pay the facility fee. So, you know, you just have to really know the different laws in your area and, um, have somebody that can really fight for those contracts to be negotiated up. You know, that's the biggest thing is, you know, because even with the, the private pay, so at least with Medicaid, you'll know, you know how much everybody is getting because yeah. Medicaid, pub, you know, publishes that. But these private insurance companies, they won't tell you what they pay someone else. So someone else could be being paid more than what you're being paid. You, you don't know. So you have to have somebody that's really good at negotiating those contracts.
Yeah. Sounds like there's a lot of fighting that goes on when it comes. It's to a that. lot, right? This is why people are like, listen, I'm just going to be cash pay. Sure. Just give me, just give me the dollars, okay? Because it's it's a lot, and it's a lot of um, it's a lot of work to to chase people down and argue with them about money. And I'm not talking about you know the patients. I'm talking about the insurance companies. Right. You know, their model is okay, you submit, say I submit a bill for $5,000 and they'll send you back a note saying, oh, I'm only going to give you $1,500. How, how do you do that, right? So that's why a lot of times it's just easier to do cash pay, but that then excludes a whole lot of people if you do. So we've been really working to um, to make sure our services are as inclusive as possible, which is why we do a lot of fundraising and, you know, and um, raise money to kind of offset the costs so that we can provide families with that type of experience. Uh, so you said, what is the Hyde Amendment? Oh my goodness. Um, so the Hyde Amendment is, the Hyde Amendment of 1976 is, uh, is, um, a federal amendment that blocks uh, Medicaid funding for abortion services, right? Um, I think there, there are a few exceptions and even now they're trying to take those few exceptions away um, for you to be able to use uh, public insurance to get an abortion. So there were exceptions, they were, ve they were very narrow, you know, like if the pregnancy endangered the patient's life or if the pregnancy was a result of uh, rape or incest and they're trying to take that away now right mm -hmm. so um so basically it is uh, an amendment that prohibits uh public uh, insurance from being able to be used uh to um to 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 get abortion services um now there are a few states who actually um, where you can use your public um, insurance to, to get abortion services, but they are very few and they are definitely not in the saddle. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so the Hyde Amendment uh, it just prohibits use, the use of public um, insurance for, um, to get to get abortion services, how does the Hyde Amendment impact birth centers and choices in particular? Well, the Hyde Amendment doesn't necessarily impact birth centers at all, right? So it's specifically targeting abortion services, and using public insurance for abortion services. So it doesn't target us, our birth center or birth services. Now, of course, it impacts our services where we provide a, our abortion services, and makes it hard for. Um, there are, there's no, I'm trying to think, there are no, there are really no private insurances in this area that will cover people's abortion services either. So what the, the barrier is, is that you have to come up with the money to be able to um, pay out of pocket for your abortion services, right? So what we found is that we have to then rely on raising monies for people to be able to have those services and also uh, abortion funds. You know, there's many different abortion funds available uh, in the, uh, from NAF to, you know, uh, uh, ARC in Georgia and I think Sister Reach, even Tennessee has an abortion fund. So there are a lot of different abortion funds and those are ways that we've been able to help people to fund their abortion. But yeah, uh, Hyde Amendment really hurts because they can't use their uh, public um, insurance and they really can't use their private insurance either to cover the cost. So they have to pay out of pocket. Yeah. Um, trap laws. Mm, yep, trap laws are designed to make it more difficult for people to access abortion. How does this impact choices, ability to have an abortion clinic? Okay, that's a good question. How does it um, impact us having them both intertwined? Um, well, you know, trap laws, I'm sure you all know, are targeted regulations of abortion providers. In Tennessee, we presently have a 48-hour waiting period for um for persons who are seeking abortions. So they have to wait 
they have to come for two different visits. They come for one, um, they come for one visit, which is a counseling visit, and then they have to come for another visit 48 hours later to actually have their abortion. So the, of course, that is a huge barrier in terms of them uh, getting to the clinic, you know, transportation can be a barrier, taking time off from work could be a problem, uh, finding childcare, you know, they're losing money if they're, they're missing work. So, um, so this, of course, affects our ability to provide, you know, abortion services. But um, there also, we recently had a, the, the six-week ban, which was, uh, fortunately, was, um, you know, overturned in the courts, uh, but all of these things just make it harder for us to be able to provide people with the services that they need and that they want. Um, I think that one of the things that it makes it hard for us, not so much our birth and services, but just that it's, it's very taxing to have to fight these things on a regular basis. And it really just, it can be a distraction from what's most important, which is providing patient care. And so um, that's really the biggest thing. Um, Tennessee has also applied for this waiver. Texas has um, has this waiver where uh, um, state funds or public uh, insurance cannot be used at uh, at abortion clinics. So mm-hmm. Tennessee, of course, has also applied for that. Now that would hurt our pregnant people who do want to continue their care with us greatly because then they won't be able to um, to use their um, public insurance for their birth services if they were able to to um, block us from being able to care for people who have um, Medicaid. So that is one of the ways that the trap laws could possibly hurt us in the future. But right now we just take it one day at a time and we just do what we can, you know, and kind of deal with them as they come up. Yeah. How easy is it to access a birth center? It's not easy because there's not that many of them, right? Uh, and like I said, in Tennessee, we'll be the only, the second one. They're not easy to uh, access at all. And so people who are wanting to have a birth center birth have to travel a great distance to, to have a birth, um, out of hospital birth. Where does our funding come from? Ah, that's a good question. Um, our funding comes from a few sources. We fundraise, uh, we write grants, uh, and from our patient services, we, you know, we do see GYN patients. We see, uh, we provide wellness visits. So our funding comes from, from that. Usually, uh, like I said, the fundraising part. We have an amazing team that's doing fundraising. So they they get out there and tell our story. I really feel like that's all of our jobs. So we all are just out there telling the story and looking for different funding streams. And, uh, and we've been successful with that. Um, is fundraising easier or harder now that choices have grown? Uh, I think it's actually easier. You know, I think it's easier for us to tell our story. I think people are more apt to listen to us now. You know, like I said, abortion is highly stigmatized. And that uh, when we start telling our story as being this comprehensive reproductive health care center, I think that it, it has gotten us in places and indoors that we had not been before. Um, but, you know, fundraising can be hard, period, right? So we, we had to raise money for the building and we also raised money for, for our patient assistance uh, funds, which are really important to us. What barriers do we encounter with fundraising? Um, I think that we were new to fundraising before we, you know, had to raise the money for the for the building. So we were like really babies in it, and um, and really getting to a point where we can um, we can uh, we've been we've been doing really good at telling the story. Now I think we've learned fast, and uh, I think but I think that the abortion part is still a barrier for some, right? Um, there funders or foundations that don't want to fund uh, places that uh, offer abortion services. And, you know, that's fine. We just kind of move on to the next one. We, we don't, um, we don't worry about that, you know. Someone in the chat wanted to know 
um, how many birth centers are there in the U.S.? That's a good question. It's about 400. I remember I had a conversation with Leslie Welch in Detroit, and she's uh, doing the birth equity fund there, and she kind of gathered all this data, and it was even less than 10% of them were owned by Black people, 14, 15 of them, right? So uh, it's, all, it's, it's maybe about, yeah, three, 400 birth centers in the country. Yeah, how does that status as a nonprofit fit into the services we provide? Our mission is to provide uh, high quality, non judgmental care and um, to meet people where they are. We, you know, we are trying to provide radical health care. We're trying to be a, a disruptor to a system that has been broken for a long time. So uh, I think that our status as a nonprofit really helps us because we're not looking at the bottom line like, oh, we have to make a profit. We, we're trying to keep the lights on make sure everybody's still paid, trying to pay everybody a living wage. We're one of the few few places in the city that uh, really one of the first in the city that um, that uh, where our staff was making at least $15 an hour. That was very important to us. Uh, and we have worked really hard to provide, you know, benefits in terms of, you know, uh, paid uh, parental leave and things like that, because we want to model uh, what we want to see in the world, right? So that's been really important to us. And I think that our nonprofit status helps us live up to that mission. Um, and you say, how does being a 501c3 impact our ability to, to lobby and advocate for patients? We, um, we don't do any direct lobbying. Uh, we actually partner with uh, our sister organization, Healthy and Free Tennessee, which was born out of choices uh, back in, I think like maybe 2014. Uh, Healthy and Free Tennessee was born out of choices and I need to be able to lobby and advocate for patients on the Hill. We do work in terms of helping patients become advocates and being able to tell their own story and recognizing their own power in their story. And, and so that is really important to us as well because, you know, the patients, are really the ones who are gonna, you know, speak up and lead the way. Let's see, replicating, I think the next one is about replicating choices. Or is choices a utopian institution? I'm gonna say it's a utopian institution. <laughs> I do think that, I, but I do think it's replicable, right? <laughs> I do think that I will say that the work that I'm doing at Choices and the people I work with at Choices has been by far the best experience I've, I've had. Uh, it's been like a, it, like I said, it's been a heavy lift, but we are really dedicated to not only um, the work, but to each other. And I have never worked at a place where I feel like I'm cared for as a person and as an individual in this way. And so, I, um, like I said, we are really trying to model what we want to see in the world. Uh, and the way we care for our, our staff and the way we care for our patients. Uh, I do think it's replicable. I think that um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to be a model, right? We wanted to show that it could work, especially because we are centering, you know, the most vulnerable in our community. And we know that if we center the most vulnerable in our community, we can build a healthier, stronger Memphis, right? And so, in doing that, we were saying, okay, uh, what are the things that the community needs? So we asked them, what is it that you need? What is it that you want? What is it that you would like to see? Because, you know, we don't have all the answers, but they, they know what they want, right? So, uh, so taking that information and being able to uh, then provide care. I think one of the things that I will say is that other clinics can do is to really do that work in the community see what the community need, feels it needs and really trying to figure out how they can meet the community where they are. Um, I think that adding birth services is um, necessary. I don't, I think that people think that it is money in birth. There's no money in birth. I'm gonna tell y'all that. No money in birth, okay. <laughs> but there's a lot of rewards in the in the work that we're doing, but I do think it's replicable, especially for other uh, abortion clinics who are being targeted by 
uh, these crazy laws and legislations. And we have to be here and we have to be open long enough to be able to continue to fight those things, right? We have to be open and present long enough to be able to continue to fight against the injustices that many people are facing in their reproductive health care. So, uh, so yeah, so it is definitely replicable and we're, we're open book. We tell everybody what we do. We, you know, it's, it's no secret and we'll tell you how, what, what areas we failed in and, and, and how we, you know, compensated for those things. But I think the biggest thing is to, and I've said it before, is to fail fast so that we can, you know, kind of move forward and, and assess what it is that we did wrong and, and make some changes. And I think that the, if one of the things I will say is uh, it's a very safe space to work in the failing. So, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. Right. Incredible. True. Um, how can we advocate for this much needed care? Yeah. I think that, that, you know, it's a lot of wonderful people out there advocating for midwifery care and working really hard to uh, address um, the disparities and inequities and the racism we are seeing in our, you know, in our system, um, you know, along with, uh, it's just, it's a lot of work, but it's doable, right? So how can we advocate for, um, I think that definitely getting behind and supporting midwifery care, find out what the laws are, where you live, um, and what the legislation um, looks like in terms of uh, supporting midwifery care, but also, you know, birth centers. Um, there was a birth center in the eastern part of Tennessee that had been there for many years, and that birth center uh, is closed now. And so, where do those families go? And what, you know, what care do those families get to have? So, um, there are opportunities, there, there are huge gaps, and we just have to kind of fill in those gaps where we can. You know, I saw this gap here in Memphis, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fill in that gap. So, yeah, I think that also reaching out to other people who are doing the work. I get emails from students, from people all the time, I, and I respond to everyone. I just, you know, we have to, yeah, my 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 staff was like, you're crazy. You talk to literally everybody. If they send me an email, I email them back, uh, especially students, because a lot of times the pathway to midwifery is not clear, and they really want to understand that, and so, uh, and to, to help them make a a plan where they don't they're not in so much debt when they finish that it's not even you know advantageous who who wants to owe a mortgage when you when you're finished and you're not going to really um yeah it's just that's not cool right so there are different ways that we can definitely help people to um map out their their plan and help them to be able to be a um a benefit to their community so that's ultimately what we're trying to do yeah I think you did have another question. Hold on, let's see what it is. Um, about the LGBTQ and transgender healthcare in our, yeah, in our model. It's really important to us. I mean, because like I said, for a long time, and still we had, you know, for a long time, people were not able to get hormone therapy um, in our community. And, um, and we still have patients that are coming up to three hours away to, you know, to access care. Um, but it's really important. We 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 made it a a, a priority, right? And you said in a nation where pregnancy is very gendered, yeah. How can we advocate for other health clinics to be more inclusive? Yeah, you know, people have to want to to do it, right? Um, that was very important to us that we provided care that was sensitive and affirming, and you know, honoring of people's life and um there are many places here in memphis that they can't get that type of care and so then they come to us with their horror stories right so it was really important to us that we have a trained staff that uh, also was on board with that so you know we we in the past had staff persons who weren't on board with that and you know we parted ways right because this is part of our our mission and this is who we are so um if you, you know, this may not be the place for you to work and that's okay too. Um, but we were very clear that that was very important to us that we did, didn't uh, want to work in a space where we had people who, um, you know, intentionally, you know, reproduced harm and, you know, misgendered people and uh, just didn't make an effort to 
um, be caring and welcoming. So it's, it's, it's ingrained in, um, in the fabric of who we are and we've been very intentional about that. So, um, but yeah, you know, pregnancy is very gender, but we don't, we don't, I don't talk about it in that way. And I don't think the people in the, in our clinic do either, you know, we talk about pregnant people and, um, and birthing people and, and recognizing that everyone has a different experience and, um, really honoring that. And so recognizing that we have a skill, but, um, but we are not the expert. That's really important too. Let me see. I, th I think that may be your, your last question to me. Oh, and this is about healthy and free, which is our, our advocacy arm. Um, yeah, I did want to drop in. They have a volunteer page. So if you're in the Tennessee area or, you know, your heart's in Tennessee, yeah, uh, you can, they have online activism and, and you can sign up to be able to send letters to the editor and share your story, meetings with mm -hmm. lawmakers, which I'm sure now are going to be Zoom um, right. meetings. And then you can even do a deeper dive and do campaign committees. And so, I mean, in APW, National Advocates for Pregnant Women, where I work is just such a huge, huge fan of Healthy and Free Tennessee and the yeah. work that they do. And so, you know, check out Healthy and Free Tennessee and donate to Choices. I mean, it is a, an amazing place to to invest your money because it yeah. goes right back into the community if you're, yeah, you know, absolutely. looking to, to advocate with your, with your wallet. <laughs> that last question, if I can find it, why do you think reproductive healthcare has been split up in modern healthcare? It makes sense for it to be holistic. Why is yeah. it? I think because we have real problems with sex and sexuality right and so you know you know I had a shirt on the other day I was in the store and I have an amazing t-shirt collection I'm just gonna let you know I, I wear you know it says so the shirt said grown and sex positive you know and people looked at me like I was crazy and I think that this idea that people have sex for some reason is so far out there but how do people get pregnant if they don't have sex right and so we kind of like really just separated the, you know, sex from uh, reproductive health care. And even just, you know, I've talked to providers when I do lectures. I, um, I was at one place where I was doing a lecture about sexual and reproductive health care. And the uh, provider was a, a nephrologist. So he was a kidney doctor. And I was like, do you talk to your patients about this sexual and reproductive health care? And I'm like, no, I, I take care of their kidneys. We, they have sex. And we have seen many people who are on dialysis on the labor and delivery floor because, you know, no one has talked to them about the fact that they can still get pregnant, right? So I think that the fact that we kind of separate these two and that we don't talk about, we don't want to talk about pleasure. We don't want to talk about sex. We don't want to talk about any of those things. And I talk about all of those things, you know, I talk about all of those things in clinic and, and those things are very important to a person's life and to having a, a healthy, uh, whole, you know, life and being a whole being. But I think a lot of times we kind of just, um, you know, separate them from that. Even like I said, even in pregnancy, this whole idea that, uh, oh, we can't talk about sex or sex is taboo. We'll, they're not the Virgin Mary. How do you think that they got pregnant, right? So it's just, it's very unfortunate, but um, but even with our teenagers and like in Tennessee and I, you know, I'm not from Tennessee, but uh, Tennessee and in the South, they're, this is an abstinence only state, right? Which meaning that the education is an abstinence only education. So, you know, we have students to come in and talk to us about things. And I'm like, wait a minute, where's your parents? Where's the school? What are they doing for you all? So we have to really get back to recognizing that reproductive health care is a part of all of our health care, you know, and uh, even if, you know, when you, um, when you go to your own providers and, uh, and see them in clinic, you should make them talk to you about your reproductive and sexual health. Uh, I think that we have a more informed group of people now, you know, we can kind of Google a lot of things because I, you know, I meet lots of people who gra graduated from Google University, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I don't, I don't shame them. I answer their questions and um, yeah, I answer their questions and it's really, really important that, um, 
we kind of recognize that we are sexual beings and we have to really reclaim that part. And that's why we are living in this um, healthcare system that is siloed. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, again, thank you so much, Nakia, for being part of a health clinic that's taking down these two really important silos of siloing abortion and birth, you know, and starting there and then bringing in, let's talk about sex, because we're talking about abortion and birth, you know, and let's talk about pleasure and let's talk about this real holistic view of you as a person, you know, the person sitting in front of you, that's... Yeah, I work, uh, you know, I... Fortunately, you know, I, I worked by myself for a long time. Now I don't. I have this really great midwifery team now. You know, we have uh, three other midwives now um, who are amazing and really make my load light, you know, and really make it possible for me to kind of uh, focus on some other things besides patient care. But, uh, you know, this work has been um it's been great. And what we're doing at Choices is definitely replicable. And what our hope is, is that other people will want to do it in their communities and provide this full spectrum care. Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. how could they not? Like, it's just just so much good that comes from it. It's just- Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Dr. Nakia Grayson, thank you so much for carving the time out. Oh, we have someone in the chat saying thanks to the mother of many. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> and just, you know, thank you so much again for carving this time out and for answering everyone's questions. Those that are asked ahead of time and in the chat. Um, this has been wonderful. And I'm glad, I'm glad to be with you. I, I enjoyed it. So you all follow us and uh, keep up with what we're doing. And like I said, I'll take some pictures tomorrow when I'm at the building. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. And well, having me. <laughs> we'll see you on Instagram. Okay. Take Keep care. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.